I think I figure out where I'm supposed to be looking now, but I think it's right there. Yes. Good evening and welcome. I'm Adam Block, Chair of the Needham Planning Board, and I uh, find a quorum. I call this meeting to order uh, for April the 4th. This meeting of the Planning Board is being conducted uh, in a hybrid manner consistent with current state regulations and is being recorded. All supporting materials for this meeting, including the agenda, are available at the town's website, which is needhamma.gov. Um, and our first order of business is a request to extend the action deadline for major project site plan special permit number 2021-01 uh, relating to the property 100-110 West Street. Uh, we have the attorney with us who's made the request to uh, to extend. But before I call you up, is Lee here? Lee is here. Lee, can can you hear us? You hear me, Lee? Yes, I can hear you just fine. Perfect. Okay, I'm going to ask Attorney Sullivan to come on up. <clears throat> and um, oh, do a roll? I think we're all here, so I think we. Except Miss Foster. Oh, yeah, sure. but that's the thing. If she comes by, if she comes in by Zoom, and we'll keep an eye out for her. And if would you mind, are you able to send her another reminder or like a, another okay. link just in case? Oh, yeah, I maybe. Okay. okay, if not understandable. If that if she comes in remotely to answer your question, then we'll do a roll call vote. Okay. But otherwise, she's just absent, and we can carry on. Um. So, uh, perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Sorry, I'm just saying hello to my family for a second. Sure. <laughs> thank you. I uh, appreciate that. Um, thank you very much. Sure. Uh, so, Attorney Sullivan, why don't you kick us off with a request? What's going on? And sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Right. I'm Sullivan of Golston and Stores here on behalf of uh, the applicant. I think as the board knows, there's an existing special permit for 100 West Street. Um, the request uh, this evening is to extend the expiration of that uh, special permit for 12 months. A little bit of background on the request. Um, you know, since the issuance of that special permit, our client, the property owner, um, has been working to, to put forward a project. Most recently, they submitted an application uh, for a slightly uh, or for a different uh, for a different program. That was submitted actually as a new application rather than an amendment. Um, during that process, we heard a lot of comments, a lot of comments from the board, a lot of comments from the public, all of which are helpful. Um, the idea is to really come back with uh, the most thoughtful application we can. In order to do that, we'd like some time. Um, you know, COVID has obviously been challenging for this kind of use. Uh, we're currently in a pretty difficult economic environment as far as interest rates and sources of equity. So. We certainly believe there's good cause and would like to, uh, you know, take the comments we heard to heart and, and submit an application that's thoughtful and responsive. So that's the background on the request. Thank you very much. Uh, for the record, I note that Natasha Spada is present. We have a full uh, board this evening. Thanks. Um, we are just on our first order of business, which is relating to an extension of the action deadline for 12 months, correct? Yes. So the expiry of that permit would be uh, June 24, yes. 2024. That's right. It's a, yes, I put it in the letter, but yes, that's right. Yep, okay. June 14th. June 14th, yeah. 2024. Okay, uh, just to catch you up to speed. Thank you. Um, uh, do any of my colleagues have any comments or questions about the extension? No. Okay, Are um, you? I guess the only question is, it's stating in here that you're looking for an extension, but also said regarding the uh, new, it looks like you're talking about a new proposal potentially with eight, now 83 assisted living units in the yeah. county, and then 72 independent living. Are you saying that you're already broadcasting potential? Nope. We're just asking for an extension of what's been approved already. Just a 12 month extension of what the existing special permit. Yeah. That reiterates what the um, approval was for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tasha, do you have any comments on this one? No, I don't know. Are there anything else? No, no thanks. Mr. Then, Chair, yes. I move that um, we approve the request for the extension of the existing permit um, for 100 West Street for one year until June 24, 2025. 
June 14th. 14th. We have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, any discussion? Hearing none. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, unanimous decision. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Motion passes, and we'll see you on this hopefully in less than a year. Yes. <laughs> very good. Thanks, so. Thank you. Have a good one. All right. Um, next up is our continued hearing, uh, which was noticed for 710. But Lee, if all parties are here, can we start the no. process? No. We can't. No. So, we have to give right. the public a chance to, even though it's, it's, it's a hearing. Hearing. Yes, hearing. yes, you're right. Absolutely right. So we're going to ask you guys to hold on for <laughs> about four minutes while we do a little bit of business. Um, um, the correspondence I'll read into the record. We have a letter dated March 24 from uh, the Massachusetts Department of Housing and Community Development, which uh, to Natasha and Jean, to your hard work, notes that we've achieved interim compliance. So thank you very much for all of the hard work and preparation for the action plan. Um, uh, that's been approved. Uh, and then we have a deadline for December 31 next year to uh, um, uh, for the final action for approval. Um, and then the other piece of correspondence we've received uh, an email uh, dated March 30 from the League of Women Voters in Needham uh, with a reminder of the warrant meetings on April 24th at 7.30 p.m., which will occur at the Center for the Heights. And uh, they've requested a list of planning board members who will attend so they can uh, um, move us to multiple rooms uh, to explain the Warren articles uh, by April 20th. Uh, so we will have some four days before the actual event. We when, have to when do we meet again? We meet again? I think, our, is it 25th? Yeah, so we yes, meet. we meet on the 25th. Yeah, so we don't meet again until after. So I guess we have to. So it's just a scheduling. Usually you guys ready. just tell me what rooms you want to be in, and then I can email her. Right. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll be there. And I'll probably, I know I always have to choose the room that has my own precinct in it, precinct F. Right. Yeah. And Tasha and I are both in precinct C, so and, you know, and I, I, I can do live. Well, I'm an E. And they have multiple we'll precincts. And yeah, exactly. And so, I'm planning Natasha, on going you choose right. where you want to be. And, I'll take you. Yeah, and I'm planning on going right now, but I may need to travel that day. But if I do, I'll let you know. But I, I'm, I'm, right now, I'm planning on going. Okay. If, so, C, D, and you want to do what's left? A, a, B, a B, C is left. A, so, a B, and C, D. Uh, I put Adam and D, E because he's E. Oh. oh, I thought it was H and E, but okay. It's A B C D E F G oh, H I J. A B C is together. So yeah. you need four, if not five. So I'll put you it in A B C. Five. Aren't there five rooms? Uh, uh, no, there's, there's four. four. So oh, there's yeah, they put three and one. Oh, so because two. because I I mean I I want to come, I admit, but I may have to travel if you put me with someone and then I. Can why don't you up. Why don't you put a put us down. together? With okay. A B C. Okay. <laughs> so, I really feel like I'm I'm missing Ernie and Bert here. <laughs> Whenever we deal with this, uh, good, okay. So I think we're fairly settled. If anything comes up, we can deal offline. It's just a scheduling thing, so it's not a violation of open meeting law. And what what role are you in? I'm going to be doing D and E. Mm -hmm. D like Donald right, Duck and E like Echo. I'll send you all this so you know what I've told them. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Artie will do any of them. Artie is doing the HIJ. It's seven ten. Why don't we have uh, ourselves continue the multiple hearings for nine twenty South Street for the definitive subdivision and in respect of the scenic road act and the public shade tree act? I'll note for the record, and Lee, uh, you're up in case I err on this. Mm -hmm. But if I remember correctly, we were holding this hearing open really to receive effectively three critical elements. Um, uh, satisfaction from the Department of, 
uh, from public safety, from the fire department, which we've received, satisfaction from the police department, which we've received. And then the third item related to Ed Olson. I'm grateful, Alex, that you included the whole content of the file into our packets. Uh, I noticed that the select board intended to have a hearing at one of its meetings related to, I think, the Public Shade Tree Act. Uh, but in any event, I do recall we saw in the minutes that Ed Olson, who is our town arborist, attended the planning board hearing. And in the process of doing that, um, I acknowledge the removal of the two and supported the removal of the two trees and requested a uh, donation, I think, of $400 to a tree fund, uh, which I'm going to assume that you'll agree to do, correct? Sure. So we'll note that as a condition, I think, Lee, in our... Yes, and actually, just, just to clear the record up, um, when there's a scenic roads application, um, the public shade tree hearing and the scenic roads application get merged into a singular hearing, and the planning board has jurisdiction. So I think Ed was proceeding initially, um, not knowing that this actually triggered a scenic roads application, which is why he prepared that handout that you have in the form that you see it. But there was never a, a, a hearing in front of the select board. The hearing was held in front of the planning board um, at the commencement of this process, which was on December the 19th. Great. Thank you for the clarity. Um, do sure. my, yes, do my colleagues have any yeah. other comments? And yeah, um, I, I, since we have the hearing still open, I, I would like to quickly go over the request for waivers just to make sure that I've got yeah. clarity on all of them. Okay. Um, so I've got, we've got um, A through G and A, we've discussed the waiver for the, for the width from 50 feet to 20 feet for the, for the roadway. Um, and similarly, for the pavement from 24 feet to 18 feet. And Paul, just, discuss that. Just, to, just to put a, a pause on that for a second, that's because this is effectively what amounts to a private way to access two homes. And therefore, it's not required to have two-way traffic all the time, the way that a typical road would have and be required to be 50 feet. Is that correct? Exactly. Exactly. This will be perpetually a private way, <clears throat> and it will only serve the two houses. So it doesn't have the amount of traffic that a regular road would have. And it's not contemplated to ever be uh, requested that this road be accepted as a public way. So uh, if it was, if there was a request to make it a public way, it would have to be 40 feet wide, conforming with 24 feet of pavement, sidewalk on one side, and so right. on. Okay. Right. I just wanted to clarify the rationale yeah. for that. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. And then we have um, the waiver for the radius and turnaround being reduced from 60 feet to 50 feet. I remember we discussed mm -hmm. that. Um, the waiver for the curbing requirement. Um, I don't remember discussing that. You want to just briefly describe? Um, the waiver is for in the curbing. Sure. So, and, and, it, and may I interject just to add your, to your question? This exhibit A um, relates to the earlier set of plans. Are all the waivers the same? Yes. For the new set of plans. Yes. Yes. Because we kept we kept the design the same. We simply dropped it down three feet. So, so basically the. Everything else, everything's the same other than just the height that it's at, essentially, the elevation right And the drainage on the middle Yes, that's right. Right. All right. So um, so to answer your, your question, Ms. Albert, the, um, the the rules and regulations call for granite curbing around the circle. And in this instance, where where basically once you get past the first lot, the addition bit of the road in the circle really only serves the one house at the at the end. There's no uh, real need for granite curbing around that circle. What we do is the uh, called Cape Cod berm, which is basically just kind of a thick asphalt that kind of goes around both sides all the way around the circle instead of granite all the way around, which is a bit of overkill for just one house, basically. Okay. Uh, the next one is a waiver um, a requirement of sidewalks on both sides of the road outlet. Um, the road layout, which um, I don't remember if we discussed it, but it's something that the two 
the two large subdivisions we, we've been granting that regularly. Um, but then your last one is a general waiver of construction. You want to explain that one for me? Right. So, so this goes to, this speaks to the fact that this is really, as, we, as I've described it throughout, a glorified driveway. And um, we have on the plans a typical cross section that shows the type of construction. And generally that conforms to the requirements, but this is a catch all kind of to the extent that anything got missed, that basically we have details on the plans that say, this is what we're gonna do. This is how we're gonna build it. And so this captures, says what's shown in the plans, what's been reviewed by engineering. That's what we have to build. We don't have to build something different than that. And so basically you haven't, totally compared what you're building to the subdivision requirements to make sure that it conforms. And so if you're missing something, we're waiving it in our decision. Is what so, you're asking us to which do. is why I want to ask Lee before you answer. <laughs> Lee, you're muted. We don't historically do that. Um, we generally just call out the waivers that have been asked for that we are aware of, and we grant them. Um, and if there's a problem on the plans, um, there's a problem on the plans, and they've got they have a problem. But we don't grant blanket waivers that are undisclosed. Yeah, and so uh, also, Lee, your camera's off, by the way, but now you're we can hear you. I'm sorry. Oh. Okay. Um, Okay, so I've just asked Lee to answer that question on your behalf. <laughs> uh, Paul, continue. No, um, that's the end of the list. I don't think we want to grant your request for G, um, but I think we've been here before, George. Hey, I was just going to say, I, I always put it in, and I never expect it to be granted. <laughs> I don't forgive us. <laughs> so, um, uh, Jean, do you have any other comments? Number three is, is the most kind of thing. Number yes. Three, waiver of any and all right. other requirements that may be necessary. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, no, we're not going to grant that. <laughs> Do you have any other comments or questions? Um, I, I was just looking at the plan to clarify in my own mind that there is no sidewalk whatsoever. It's not that you're putting Correct. it on one side of the street rather than two. Right. There's, There's not, not to be any right. sidewalk. And with the two lot subdivision, I think we've granted that kind of waiver. Particularly, yeah. right. I think, because one is behind the other. So usually it, against my vote. <laughs> in in so that that specific aspect is in part because it is just two houses, two lots, but also because there's no sidewalk on South Street. So even if even if, to be honest, even if this were say four houses, I probably would still ask for a waiver of sidewalks because it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to have a sidewalk coming off of a sort of a side road that doesn't have as much traffic to a main road that has no sidewalk. So yeah, I we probably have, would have asked for that. We have more houses. I probably insist on it regardless, but I understand yeah, the that, rationale. That, that would be an interesting request. Yeah. I don't know which way. I'm, I'm not going to comment on which way I might vote on that. But you never know what the you know. town would do with its roads in the future. Yes. Was, as David Tobin once said to me when I asked him for a legal opinion on something, he said, I don't answer hypothetical questions. Yes, exactly. <laughs> no. Artie, do you have any comments? Uh, no. Natasha, do you have any comments? No. So Lee, do we have everything uh, necessary to uh, close the hearing at this time, all hearings? Yes, we do. Okay, right. Mr. Chair, yes. I think you should read into the record the, the um, responses that we got from fire. And I thought I, 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 I think I effectively did by saying that we've received emails this week from both the department, both the fire department and the police department set with their satisfaction. Oh, okay. I must, um, have, I must have zoned out. I'm sorry. I, don't, I can't blame you. I was gone for a while, but I'm back. <laughs> Good to have you back. Um, I, the only other note that, that's really effectively outstanding that we did touch on last week is <laughs> your appointment with the Conservation Commission, which we also discussed would be, uh, we already have a, a typical condition in, the, in Needham's uh, um, boilerplates uh, um, uh, permit that speaks to having you know a satisfaction from all other sure. municipal boards. So that'll be the you know consistent here, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that meeting's after this. So <clears throat> unless anyone has any other objection or comment, uh, can I have a motion to close uh, each of the hearings, please? 
Yes, I move that we close the hearing for the uh, uh, request for approval of the subdivision plan for 920 South Street. And I move that we close the hearing for the um, uh, request for the scenic road and public tree, tree, tree tax for removal of two trees. Second. So we have two motions on the floor. We have a second for two motions. And any discussion on either? We'll take the first motion first by vote. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed by nay. The first motion carries unanimously. The second motion, uh, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed by nay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's so exciting. The record is clear that it was unanimously affirmed on both accounts, on both motions. We close the hearing and wish you well with, uh, with your construction uh, and the process. Now, the next phase will obviously be for us to uh, have our decisions, Lee. When do you anticipate the decisions? Um, I anticipate drafting a decision and having it in front of you at your next meeting on April the 25th. Um, and so my plan, unless I hear from you otherwise, was to prepare um, the standard kind of decision that we do for these private way two lot subdivisions, which is to basically uh, grant uh, the waivers that they've articulated and I think you've agreed with tonight. Um, and then to require that the way be private, that the homeowners maintain it in perpetuity and all the supporting systems that go along with it. Um, and then all of our traditional kinds of conditions relative to construction, um, including, I think, in this case, um, the submittal of a landscaping plan for the cul-de-sac that's detailed that we don't have yet. And the landscaping plan that um, that's going to happen with the abutter so that that's all kind of integrated into the final plan set. Uh, that's approved and that will also then reference all the documents that need to be prepared and go on record, which includes the covenant and any um, associated easements. So um, my plan is to prepare that for the 25th. Now, there are some conditions that you can think of that kind of go outside of our normal framework that you want to bring to my attention. That would be helpful. George, can you think of any? No. Um, George wants to waive it. Some well, we, we, have his, we have his list, um, but I, uh, okay. Yeah, so it's actually, George, if you ask a waiver of the waiver, that, <laughs> that, that, that turns off. So be careful about that. It obliterates your waivers altogether, okay? The old double negative. Double error. negative, no waiver for the waivers. So, um, Brian, do you have any questions for us? I don't think so. I think, okay. I think we're in pretty good shape. So the... So the goal will be that on, uh, in 20 days, the decision will have already been drafted and will be to us to discuss on the 25th. And then hopefully we'd be in a position to be able to vote the relief yeah. and vote the decision that night. But what else do we have on our agenda for that night? Lee or Alex? I'm looking. Okay. Uh I didn't have it opened. Okay. So depending on what else we have, but hopefully we'll be able to mm -hmm. move through it. Wingate continuation, cook outdoor dining. Okay. Board of Appeals. That's April 25th. Mm -hmm. Did you say Coca-Cola? Board of Appeals. Also uh, cook outdoor dining. Cook out, okay. All right. Okay. Um, we'll right. see you in 20 days. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good to have you guys. Good luck. And thank you uh, to the better for coming in as well. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very kindly. Thank you. Very good. Good night. Good night. Um, we'll momentarily have uh, a discussion with uh, the CAPC chair, but until he arrives, I just saw him. Yeah, no, I got it. Thanks, George. Um, the temporary outdoor I was just a, thanks. I was just going there actually. So the only change that we have for this uh, um, for the outdoor uh, temporary outdoor seating 
an outdoor display policy was just to extend the date to April 1st, 2024 instead of 2023. And that, um, or as a date later, uh, we'll be right with you. Um, that's the only change is just the date pursuant to the governor's uh, updated orders. So uh, does anyone have any comments about this? Okay, so uh, need would you let we need a motion, correct? Mm -hmm. You're muted, Lee. Yes, you need a motion to extend the date um, in accordance with the revised document. So, so we have a motion. Do I have a second? Sure. We have a motion by Natasha, second by Artie. Any discussion? Hearing none, I'll come to the vote. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, hearing no opposition, the motion carries unanimously. This brings us to uh, our discussion with the CAPC Chair, Stephen Frail on Climate Smart uh, Zoning Reform. Uh, Stephen, it's good to have you. If you can say your name and address to the record. Sure. Stephen Frail, 29 Power Street. So uh, as I understand it, uh, Natasha, you and I uh, already both um, participate and are on the main CAPC in addition to some of the subcommittees, correct? Correct. And your quorum has been resolved because you've already- We have officially posted this exactly. meeting under the Climate Action Plan Committee as well, just in case we have four, uh, which is possible. We may have one or two more people show up tonight. There's some more attendees so, that are though, if you can click on that. Oh yeah, sure, of course. Yeah, uh, Chris Heap advised us to do that. Oscar, well, he's not part of the meeting. He's part of our group, but he's not. Yeah, Oscar's not, he's not a standing he's member. Of we have seven standing members. And then okay, we have, so the fourth person. Should the fourth person we had a quorum. Yeah. Uh, there, in addition to that, uh, we had about 40 or so uh, people from across the uh, different sectors in Needham who volunteered for a short period of time. They would not trigger a quorum. Right. But, uh, Yes. Council of five would be good to have it just in case we got into deliberations. So um, I'm looking to bring it over screen. There we go. So uh, we have your deck. Would you like us to put it up on the? Yeah, why don't you put that up there? Uh, that'd be helpful. Um, okay, so and that's on page 134, Alex, of our. Uh, Okay. And while you're doing that, I can maybe just for those who are not Please. familiar with what we are, uh, where, where our charter started, I can tell you a little bit about the Climate Action Plan Committee, what we've been doing to date. Um, so we were chartered in 2022, early 2022, to come up with a climate action plan for the town. So we report to the select board. We were chartered by the select board. It's an advisory group. Um, our task is to look at state law around the, uh, the greenhouse gas reduction mandates and then to chart the path forward for Needham broadly, not just the municipal sectors, but all sectors, municipal, residential, as well as commercial. Um, and so we've been meeting for roughly a year. Um, over the course of the year, we first organized, we came up with a, uh, a project, uh, sort of a project plan, understood our charter, and then in the fall, we met with some volunteers across all sectors, as I mentioned, to come up with uh, priority actions in six areas. And one of those six areas was in zoning and permitting. Um, and so I get into that in a little bit as we go through the deck. Um, Could you hear me on for us so that I can see the screen better? Yeah, absolutely. Um, why don't we go to the second slide? So uh, before I start, this, this picture here is uh, a current state greenhouse gas inventory for Needham. So as I mentioned, the, the state has mandated that we hit net zero by 2050. Uh, net zero is, is not 100% net zero. There's some assumptions that there'll be some other mitigating um, carbon capture technologies that come and get, let's say, the last 10, 15%. But relative to our 1990 baseline, our goal is to get to roughly 80, 85 percent below our 1990 greenhouse gas emissions. This is the 20, roughly 2017 data. 
Um, and uh, we won't get into like the, the, the details of how many million tons of carbon this represents. Really wanna focus more on what sectors it comes from. Um, and so the first thing that I usually like to point out is if you look in the bottom left corner, across all of Needham, just 2.4% of our greenhouse gas emissions comes from the municipal sector. So that's all of the town buildings, all of the town equipment, vehicles, et cetera. But just 2.4%. Is that in part because um, the town's own um, ground-based solar So the, the town has actually made great strides in, in areas. Yeah. So for yeah. example, uh, this building is a ground, so ground source uh, heat pump heated and cooled mm -hmm. building, which sure, reduces exactly. carbon because we're not using natural gas or oil directly to heat or cool the building. Uh, it's more a function of the number of buildings, right? Got so it. if you look at uh, the three big pieces of the pie, passenger vehicles at yeah. about 25, about a quarter of our total greenhouse gas emissions, residential buildings, houses, about just about a third, and then the commercial industrial buildings. Uh, those are the, the big sources. There's some others, there's public transportation, commercial vehicles, construction, waste, wa wastewater uh, treatment plant, for example. But the big three are the vehicles, the houses, and the buildings. And uh, Mr. Shear, we yes. have questions as we go along? Absolutely. Oh, sure. Wait. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm fine with it if the chair is fine with it. Both chairs are fine. Go ahead. <laughs> well, Ken, so your chair also questions. The Mr. Chairs. Um, <laughs> uh, what does construction represent? Um, so, what, what activities does that represent? So, that could be a variety of activities. It could be a building construction, house construction, um, other projects, like, for example, the roadways being um, uh, repaved. Um, so, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a hodgepodge of construction activity. And it's a, uh, and it's a high, it it's high, it's requires. usually large diesel trucks, large diesel tractors and backhoes. Um, anytime you see one of those, it would kind of fall into that construction camp. And how, what do you base the 5% on? Uh, how do you measure it's, it? It's the uh, net, uh, ton, I'm sorry, the, the tons of metric tons of carbon that are emitted from those activities. And so if, this comes from a variety of different sources. Um, we have uh, MAPC data, we have data from the state, never source. And based on a very nice tool that the uh, Metropolitan Area Planning Council provided to municipalities, we're able to input um, a, a variety of assumptions. And then it comes out and it says, based on this number of buildings that you put in, this is the assumptions about how many um, metric tons of carbon are, are generated. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, related to construction activity during a certain year. Say, right. So that's the base year for 2017. So that might change over oh, time. We okay. might have variation up and down from mm -hmm. that, but um, it is you know roughly five percent on average per year. So that's where they uh, the sources they, they came from. We go to the next slide. Uh, it's slightly different um, slice. This has more to do with um, the uh, big three. Um, sorry, where were we? The source, uh, gasoline, diesel being about 29%, electricity being about 24%, and then 40% being fossil fuel heat. And is, we have a quarter being um, uh, described as the electricity. Right. Is that because all electricity are ultimately coming, is ultimately coming from a fossil fuel based? Not all. Or uh, not all. Yeah, but it's, there's right, a there's a substantial control. portion. Uh, Massachusetts such has has a very green relative to other states electricity generating sector. We make a lot of um, electricity from sources like wind, solar, right. as well as nuclear, and then uh, uh, what's the other one? Uh, hydroelectric. Hydroelectric. Right. So those are the well, major. Hydroelectric comes from Quebec, I think, right? Uh, there it's might be some up there. There's been some attempts to get more from yeah, no, Canada. Well, it's not through. But anyway, the, the point is that our electricity is not all green. We do yes. have natural gas and coal right, generated right, electricity. Right. Uh, we do have a lot of gasoline and diesel, so that correlates very simply to the uh, the transportation se sector. And then most homes in Needham are heated by natural gas or oil. Um, and so 
those are the big areas. And so from a basic formula to get to net zero, we have to green our electricity, we have to green our buildings, and we have to green our transportation. Um, and so that's the general, um, when we start to look at the key actions that come out of the climate action plan, they map very closely to those big three. Um, let me go to the next one. So uh, just for this board, really focusing more on the decarbonization of buildings, because that's really sort of more a little bit closer to your, your remit. Um, two key concepts that have come out of the working groups are um, how can we remove barriers to greenhouse gas reduction, reducing technologies? Uh, and those could be the actual generation of electricity like solar, um, or it could be in um, electrifying the heating and cooling. So are there any barriers to putting heat pumps on the sides of buildings or on the roofs of commercial buildings? Those are the types of things that, that we wanted to look at. Uh, and then the building codes as well. How do we improve the energy performance of all buildings? And I know that, that could potentially be a planning board item, but there's also building codes themselves, which have to be voted on by town meeting. Um, it's more specifically, what do you mean by that? So uh, there are a variety of different levels of building codes today. There's the base code, which, right. which uh, typically applies to all municipalities. Uh, in Massachusetts, 300, have, uh, 300 cities and towns have actually adopted what we call the stretch energy codes. And that's an above code, yeah. that's above code. And it, it mandates higher efficient buildings. Needham is one of those towns. We, we, we voted on that a few years ago. And then to be clear, as that stretch code is updated, because we opted into it, we're automatically we bring those obligated on. to uh, upgrade to the latest version of the then stretch code. Yeah. Do we automatically convert to the upgraded, or do we still have to go to town meeting to vote to upgrade? For the stretch code, it's automatic. Okay. So once you adopt right. the stretch code, you get the updates. And so the, I'll get into the details of the okay. updates later in the, in the deck. Yeah. There is a third level, a third tier that the state did uh, introduce um, more recently called the opt-in specialized code, right. which is an addendum okay. to the stretch codes. <laughs> and it really only deals with new construction. Um, but we'll get into that a little bit later. I always think the building, or I thought that the building code was a function of state law. It, it is. is, yeah. So all of this is, the building codes are all state law. Right. And, and the building codes, there's a new building code that it, that's already in effect, but it, you, you get grandfathered in until July 1st. After July 1st, there's a new version of the code. Which is that, is the new version of the building code. Uh, is it's that, the energy code, really. what's that? It's the energy code. So it's the base building code plus. Why don't we hold on it? I have slides okay. on all of this. Yeah, we'll yeah. walk through all of the details. I'm holding. I'm yeah. holding. All right. <laughs> I have slides on <laughs> it. I don't want to waste your time because we'll get back to the details. Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So if we go to the next one, this is sort of where we're going to go in the deck. Um, and so uh, the two two codes, uh, two key actions did come out of the six, uh, two of the six working groups. So. One key action, the, the zoning and permitting working group, their key action was to remove those zoning barriers where they exist for solar, heat pumps, geothermal, and energy Just efficiency. quickly, because you probably handle it later. Have yeah. you identified areas where we, we have make changes in our zoning? We have, yes. Yeah, and we uh, we actually, uh, Dave Roach came to our meeting and, and the town engineer was there as well. And we were able to look through our existing bylaws and identify a couple of gaps. Right. Yeah, and, so. and just to let you know, the zoning and permitting working group, um, I, I chaired it with Oscar and Lee was on it and Dave Roach was on it and um, Justin yeah. from the engineering department as well. So we're, we were the ones that came up with, with action items that then all the other groups came up with their action. There are six groups in total, I believe, right? That's right, six. And so um, yeah. just to let you know. Um, and so uh, if, if ever want to know what the other six four came up with, I'm happy to do that later. <laughs> but just in the interest of time, these two, Thank you. Um, the net zero buildings was uh, the key action was to adopt a specialized code at town meeting later this year. Um, so we'll get into each of those in turn. So when we looked at the, we go to the next slide, sorry. Uh, when we looked at zoning and permitting, there were several questions that we were looking at. Um, you know, what should be right, by right? What should be a by right with site plan review and what should be um, special permit. So those are one of the questions. 
Uh, what do we include in our definitions? So looking at things like rooftop solar, ground-based solar, solar canopies, how do we define size, energy storage, et cetera? And did we, uh, did you ultimately resolve that? Yes. Thank you. A little bit. Okay. Yeah, I think we have some, we have some uh, straw men. I mean, I think we have some recommendations. We'll put it that way. Okay. So to include, okay. You're going to go. I'm going to get all of it. All right. Yes. I'm holding. I'm holding. Yeah. Uh, I'm just kind of taking you through our process for it first. Um, so we, we talked about setbacks, we talked about the site plan review process, and we looked at other things, other issues, like should we be talking about pollinator protection in some of these projects and canopy preservation, vegetation management, how did those concepts all come, come to the fore as we start to think through these zoning articles? So we go to the next one. Next slide. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, I'm sorry, this one. All right, yeah, I didn't notice you moved it already. Mm -hmm. So in our current bylaw, we do have um, quite a bit of language around the large-scale ground-mounted solar PV arrays, and that was in support of the uh, RTS solar array. Um, I think some of you probably worked on that language. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so the good news is that a lot of it's in here already. Um, you know, there might be some recommendations on how to tweak it if we want to look at things like pollinator protection and vegetation okay. management. Um, but overall, when we looked at the DOER model language, this looked like it hewed pretty closely to that DOER model the language. DOER uh, so DOER, the Department of Energy Resources, um, has model language for solar uh, planning and zoning that I think they put out in 2014. Um, and so we looked at that as one of the source documents. And I saw quite a bit of overlap between these two. So I, I figure at some point somebody was also leveraging it. Um, yeah, that, that was the foundation for the draft. Yeah, okay. That was the foundation for it. Great. Thanks, Lee. So it looks like we pulled largely, uh, we, we pulled the large scale mount, ground mounted solar, but we left out a, a number of other parts. Um, so we do have the you know over 250 kilowatt uh, DC systems. It's by right in a single overlay district today. Um, it requires the major site plan review, and then it has a number of setback restrictions, um, et cetera. So that was the key language in the document today. Let's go to the next slide. Sure, just to be clearly, the use is allowed by right, but the construction of it does require a site plan special permit. It's a by right in a single district. Yes, yeah, it's just in that overlay district that we created. Yes, which it sits, which basically sits on top of the RTS. Is that the RTS? That's right, right, right. But it, regardless of the geography, the point is that the use itself, the the use itself is allowed by right. right? No, only in that district. Yeah, it's right. by you can do it in other districts by special permit as a use. No, you I, can't. No, it was only allowed in that one location. Exactly. It was restricted to that location. And because it was restricted to that location, I think that it didn't need a special permit. It was basically the overlay district was created for that purpose. And I'm just making a yes. distinction between the use yes. versus the construction of it, which does require a special permit. It was a site plan. Site plan, site plan, plan review. review. Not right. a special permit. Though. Not a no a special issue. permit. Yeah, site plan review. That's right. Uh, and then is it, Lee, is it determined? How is it determined? Like we have the, the distinction in site plan review between uh, 10,000 square feet or 5,000 square feet. So how do we determine that we're not dealing with a building? Um, this was an overlay district which had its own specific set of rules. So it called out the the uses that were allowed by right and a large scale ground mounted solar um, installation of this type was allowed and then it basically required a special permit and then in the overlay language it talked about a site plan being required and articulated what was what was what what was what 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 plans were to be submitted as a function of that site plan approval um and what the what the criteria would be for the issuance of a special permit um, so the overlay district itself articulated all that independent of your normal section 7.4 uh, site plan special permit uh, section of the bylaw. Okay, right. Thank you. So it sounds like if we were to have this elsewhere in town, it would probably be easiest to just um, 
extend the extend the overlay district wherever it is that we're also going to allow sort of a project in town. But this this really is a large scale, it's very large, yeah. a very large. That's what I'm trying to get. Exactly. Exactly. Commercial, right. commercial scale. But is it is that twenty like, acres is the minimum lot size? Yeah, that, that's yeah, yeah. Not to imagine yeah. those. I mean, well, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, there are very, very, very few locations in Needham that would be suitable for this. Um, so, um, the other component of existent solar, the only other place we really discuss solar in our current bylaws today is in commercial district rooftops. Um, and it is, it is combined in with other rooftop equipment. So it's subject to the height restrictions of up to 15 feet. Um, it is subject to a 25% total horizontal coverage. Um, and all structures must be set back from the roof edge by a distance no less than their height. Um, and it allows the planning board to require screening equipment. So if I remember correct, if I understand correctly, uh, when this by when this bylaw was enacted, solar panels had a certain pitch to them, which meant that there was a, a particular height, but now the technology no, 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 I don't the so solar on solar on rooftops, flat roofs we never had much of a pitch because there's way too much of a wind load. Right. You know, related to the structure. So a lot, it's on times, a, a lot of times, yeah, the seven degree, 10 degree maybe. But it's not up to 25. It's not going to hit that 15, no. 15, 15 no. foot no. Um, limit. Right. The, the key, uh, when we talked to this with Dave Roach, the key probably impediment to rooftop solar on commercial today is the 25% horizontal. Yeah, exactly. that's, that's what I'm that's getting at. That's, 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 that's the concern. That, that's, the, that's, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a problem. That's a very restricted percentage. Right, right. Very, way too restricted. Yeah, Why was that put on there to begin with? Do you know? We, uh, is, is it just a carryover from other? It's, from other? No. It seems like it was just added as a type of roof structure, but it was looked at as all one item. Like you've got your rooftop. Mm -hmm. you got, yep. Okay. Well, yeah, um, I, um, I believe that our zoning, when it speaks of um, items on the roof, you yes. know, that, uh, it, it, it applies to all the items that would be on the roof. All the yeah, that's a, right. elevator a shaft. That's what you meant earlier. And yeah. so at that 25% applies to all those items, yeah. thus it applies to this as well. That's right, that's okay. right. And yeah. so one of the suggestions that uh, Dave Roach had come up with is, you might want to rethink, take solar out of the mix. Yeah. And, and rethink about how to how to yeah. zone it for commercial rooftops. And he gave a few examples of buildings where he's talked to built, uh, facilities managers would love to put solar up there, but this feels like it's blocking them. Yeah, what, what happens, it's always a good idea. You know, roughly a rule of thumb, I guess, is the height of the panel distance away from the edge. That's somewhat of a rule of thumb, especially yeah. for large, large commercial buildings. But what also happens is on large scale commercial buildings, you're leaving pathways, you're leaving walkways right. every certain amount of feet, right? To be every 50 feet, feet whatever. Yeah, you know, you're leaving pathways you can walk around the walk around the building, get to the get into the other mechanicals on the building, things right. like that. You're, you're just leaving ways for the park, even farming ways. Yeah. You're leaving access. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, before we move on, yeah. where does that quote come from? Oh, sorry, that was in the DOR handbook, or it might have been in the DOR best practices. Um it was uh, it was specific to trying to minimize restrictions on solar, and so uh, there is a state law, Chapter Forty A, Section Three, that has strong statutory protections for solar. It's uh, I think it's pretty ironclad on residential homes, uh, but the larger the project, the, the more flexibility and um, you know local municipalities have to, to put restriction on it, but they do want to remind <laughs> people as they're working on bylaws to try to loosen. In other words, much. going back to the original goal um, of removing barriers, right. it's a policy recommendation for municipalities yes. to loosen up on the dimensional regulations because they are seen as barriers or in this case, they're really talking more about aesthetic. The aesthetic. The aesthetic. Yes, right, right. right, right. So I mean, you're like in historical districts in some, some various towns, sometimes they actually very that's what they're talking about. Very specifically, specifically, they talk about 
aesthetics of where the panels can be. Right. And then every, you know, some of them are starting to loosen them up because they realize it's, 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 it's restrictive. Some people can't do it because that's the only side of the house that they can have solar panels on. Right. All of a sudden, you know, maybe we shouldn't be so restrictive as far as yeah. that. Because maybe that's maybe that's historically accurate as well and beautifully. Right. Yeah. Right. And even we actually have over 500 residential solar installations across town now yeah, exactly. um, at last count. So that's. Um, and some, some of them that I've seen are actually just totally horizontal. They don't have a pitch at all. It's the same pitch of the roof. Almost, almost every single solar array on a pitched roof will be parallel. Wow. Will be parallel yeah, to the roof. Pitch. Yeah, it will, it will be parallel. We don't have any them. zoning. Mm -hmm. That deals with those residential now. No, no David said not, uh, that there's no point. restrictions on the top so solar for residential. Right. Um, that he, in fact, he even mentioned that there was. We'll get into this in a second, but small scale, round base solar. Um, there's actually two installations in in in, um, yeah. in Needham, and they were done under the accessory strike structure. Yeah. Um, was that on someone's residential property? Yeah, or residential. Yeah. residential. Yeah. yeah, one's over, one's over near the uh, near the new. Oh, where the pine forest is disappearing. Right? Yes. So you yeah. mentioned that we've got 500 residential. Residential. Um, does that include multifamily residential, or is that 500 sing single family? I believe that's single family there, structures. In general, there's very few multifamily solar systems. Okay. By almost, but not by, I'm not going to say definition of these, but yeah, on multifamily, you have a condo sharing a roof, and a lot of times, one neighbor may want it, one neighbor, one neighbor may not want it. No, yeah, so. then you can apartment, apartment buildings very seldom ever happen to apartment. Yeah. Uh, when the single family is 500 homes, and again, how many how many single family homes do we have in town? 8,000. 8,000? Give or take, yeah. Okay. So, so that's still 7%. a small percentage. It is, yeah. And not every roof is suitable for it. So, you know, you need you really do need relatively. Um, flat, I mean, it's flat, but not a lot of gables. Mm -hmm. You need southern exposure. You, you need you, you need architects to realize on the southern surface, don't put the gables. A little restraint oh, on those gables. Gables. Oh, That's right. Exactly. You're only looking at one. <laughs> well, that's something that Dave Roach said in general. It's that it would impact the, the architectural it's styles and the designs uh, moving forward, depending upon the orientation. Sure. Gotcha. One question that I have also is yeah. that there's also that I'm looking at you because were you on the tree? Were you on the tree group? Oh, the tree, yeah. yeah, natural resources. Yeah. So and, how does that impact? Um, are we are we looking at that simultaneously to, to this because that so would impede solar? I should point out um, our recommendations don't really have a lot to do with the residential solar. Um, our recommendations for or changes it's in the bylaw the okay. are more for the commercial solar. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And then those are typically above canopy. Right yeah. And those typically there. above yeah. canopy. Okay, so yeah. that was the question that Dave Roach also had. It was about yeah. the, the trees, trees and that, you know, yeah. if we're doing. I mean, we'll, we'll come to that in a minute. Right. Right. Yeah. So uh, why don't we go to the next slide here. So this was um, one tool that we used in the MAPC uh, recommendations for zoning and permitting. So we consulted this. Um, they, they have a bunch, there's a nice checklist and, and some ex, explanation behind each of these bullet points. But they talked about, can we, can towns expedite the solar installations, simplify the permitting process, have a narrow inspection time window um, where possible for those solars? Um, you know, do we have a carved out solar permitting web website or offer online permitting for this? We may do all of these already. Um, I'm not familiar with them, but this was just the recommendations that we wanted to pass on. So a case in point is uh, 140 Kendrick, which was Boston Properties project when they came in to us for a site plan review and special permit for their massive overhaul and a solar, solar canopy yeah, structure yeah, the park, yeah. on the parking structure. And Lee, do you remember how long that took? From their date of application to the date of decision, <laughs> it probably was um, sure four months. It four probably was not. It probably was three to four months total. Yeah. Yeah. So, so under the statute, 
when you're into a site plan, doesn't it regulate how much the minimum time frames you have on notice and no, hearing? No, there, only for the special there's permit a minimum, process. There's a time frame from application to hearing. Yes. And there's a time frame from closing the hearing to um, issuing the decision. Issuing the decision. Right. But you can continue the hearing. Right. That part of that. Right. What I'm wondering is as an incentive or an inducement, if it takes um, if it takes uh, you know it took four months, if we you know is there a way to fast track and so it's done in six weeks and is that going to have a significant so change in or adoption? Um, I gonna ask us to hold again because we have some re recommendations on that. <laughs> we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Yeah. <laughs> You tell it's me great to... we've got the conversation going, but I, I tried to tee a lot of that. Now we're going to get into the meat. So we'll go to the next one. Now. Should we let you finish the presentation? <laughs> Before, no, no, no. Your time is the committee's time. Speed lives for these moments. I do. Okay. Seriously, give me a microphone. You can't get me to stop talking. Um, all right. So the consensus in our conversation in our last meeting was that these items are not blocked. By current zoning, so residential heat pumps. Um, Dave Roach mentioned that because we our bylaw now allows for things like bay windows and overhangs to you know, in, those are treated under that. So if you put a heat pump on your on your side, it can you know it can step into the setback a little. They're not blocked, um, according to him. No barrier. If they need to be on on a pad, separate pad, they're accessory structure, right? Subject to to um, lot coverage, but uh, not blocked. Residential rooftop solar not blocked. Um, large scale ground mounted solar, you know, no, no not blocked thing, in one district. The, the only thing common at some point, I don't know if it ever come up in either, but I know, I know a number of us have heard that the large scale solar arrays coming in, they literally, a whole forest goes away to install right. large scale. Solar. I, I have issues with that. We have a recommendation yeah. on that too. <laughs> I'm holding. <laughs> I'm holding. I'm holding. <laughs> All right. So the next slide is. Um, additional items that are not blocked. Um, so, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is just a separate slide that, that basically said what I just said. <laughs> okay, so um, the highest priority items to address based on our discussion, one is solar canopies, especially over park solar canopies over parking lots and structures. Um, these are largely areas with lots of sun. They don't often have a lot of um, shade. Um, as long as the underlying use is maintained, um, you could you could structure a bylaw to make these a by right or by right with site plan review. Mm -hmm. uh, commercial rooftop solar, as we discussed, you know there's some restrictions on horizontal coverage that could be mitigated. Um, and then we don't define small and medium sized ground based solar. It might be worthwhile doing. Um, Dave did say that the small ground-based solar installations on residential properties. He's done two of them as building permits. So there wasn't even a, 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 um, permit a, a special permit or hearing on that, um, but it still might be worth at least defining that. basically accessory structure. It's accessory yeah. structure, it's yeah. subject to, yeah. to lock heard. Um, so, uh, but it might make sense to define what a small is mm -hmm. um, because- uh, In terms of impact for a second, if I may, Artie, if you have, um, Solar canopies installed, uh, or solar arrays installed in your backyard. Mm -hmm. Those are not necessarily going to be flat. Those would have oh, those will be angled. Those will be right. roughly 25, 25 degrees. So the, they'll go up. They'll go up to a height of ten to twelve feet. So they will. And so something like that. Yeah. If I'm, if I have one in my backyard. Mm -hmm. And I've got a neighbor here, and they're on their second floor in particular. If they're mm -hmm. looking in, are they going to get glare? Not, not likely. Not likely. I have the, some math on that that I can. Yeah, check. The, the angle, I'm yeah. holding. Yeah, the <laughs> angle, the angle of the sun just doesn't hit that. Way. Yeah, I mean, just you're matter. just as likely or more likely to get someone's second story yes, yeah. um, window reflecting into your yeah. house, or someone's car reflecting into your house. Then you would have a solar because of the angles that are at yeah. the sun, it bounces up pretty high. You have to be pretty close to get the yeah. sun directly into it. Yeah, the angle, the angle of the rays are usually to some extent set, not necessarily intentionally, 
set to like the summer sun. So the angle of incidence coming down is almost perpendicular to the panels, which means it's not heading back to the neighbor. It's basically just heading back in the sky. And then, then, the then, then, for, then for ones that are flatter, it very much is heading, just heading back in the sky. Right. Yeah. Um, I have a comment on solar canopies of parking lots. Yeah. In our zoning uh, bylaw, we have requirements for parking lots. That's right. Uh, that they must have, um, you know, um, planted areas between rows, right. this sort of thing, and with, with trees, bushes, that doesn't fit with the canopy. Right. Um, so right. it seems like it's one or the other. We have to think about that. This is this actually came up in our discussion with, with Dave about it. And I think on our next slide, we start to get into the solar canopies. Um, I, and I want to say one more thing about the, um, a small uh, solar on the ground as an accessory. Um, I understand that the solar isn't necessarily just bringing electricity into that house for use in that house. Um, that the electricity, now the new idea is it goes into the general um, the grid. system, the grid, right. and then they get credit for it. That's right. So it's it's hard to see the exact, um, maybe, maybe should be, I think you were suggesting that maybe we should be more specific about allowing these Rather than just saying, "Oh, of course, it's accessory." Um, well, no, I mean, and, and you say that. Well, virtually, no, 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 vir something like that. No, I virtually, know. virtually, virtually yeah. any system that'll ever be on a residential property will first tap into the house behind the meter, and then, then first the path of electrons is path of least resistance. Yeah. So, so it'll first flow into the house, but by the by usage of the house itself during the daylight when only. Houses, you're drawing so much power, it will flow back out to the street. But every solar system, no matter where it is, is, is going to have a certain percentage that flows back out to the street, and then goes to neighbors or and then every every other neighbor. That's right. where the energy and then you get the net meter. But I think I think what Gene was saying though is that uh, to be explicit that it's allowed as opposed to just treat it as another accessory structure. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Defining it in the bylaw as such, and then and then potentially, you know, talking about the so in the solar canopies, um, the the committee um, recommends to do it as as a right with site plan re, uh, review. Um, and the reason originally the first part of the discussion focused around as a right, like why not just let every parking lot owner put a solar panel up, uh, just to pull a building permit and then and go forward. But then there were a number of issues that Dave Roach raised. One was this vegetation and, and berm requirement on a number of um, parking lots. Another was um, the number of lots, right? The number of spaces, parking spaces that, that might be taken up by these columns that mm -hmm. get placed into the ground. Um, there are issues around uh, plow access during the snowstorms and then emergency vehicles access. So you need minimum heights. Uh, there's also the opportunity to capture stormwater directly off of these, mm -hmm. which could be a great benefit to the town because mm -hmm. they wouldn't have to mitigate the stormwater that hits the ground. What, are we, what do you mean by that? So um, once the, the rain, my understanding, some of you might know this more because you're on the Conservation Commission, but once once the water hits the ground, it is considered dirty. in dirty water needs remediation before it goes into the sewers. If you capture it off a canopy, it doesn't count. And so there's costs associated with the town that could be avoided. But what would, what would you, where would that water go? Uh, presumably, there's uh, wells that you would would dig. I don't know if you you actually know uh, anything. Honest, about I, don't, I don't know where they would go. I know I know at the Kendrick one, I believe it was going over. I think it was going over the Cutler Lake. I think it was that. It would the, go directly. Yeah, the well, they, where, I think it was going. It was going to be. I think it went into a filtration the, system. Yeah. I don't know like this anyway, thing. it's worth. Further discovery. Okay. I can just say that it yeah, was okay. raised as an issue that yeah. it's worth um, yeah, putting just, this in that. Just yeah. as a side, I have a friend who has a commercial, um, has a business in in on uh, Chestnut Street. Okay. So his customers park in, in that the parking in in what I guess what we call the CVS parking lot. Yes. Um, you know the municipal parking lot. And he's always concerned about the fact that there are never enough parking spaces, right. especially in the middle of the day, in the middle of the week. Don't go at two o'clock. Never, right. 
There are never, <laughs> there are never parking spaces in that lot. If you had a builder who was able to build one of these things as a bright, just goes in there and takes up parking spaces, this yeah. friend is going to be all over us like white on rice. Except, exactly. How could you allow that? Except exactly. for the fact that what you're saying is the use be allowed by right, but that the pro the construction process still requires a site plan review. With so that we right. could we could regulate. Yes. So, so we you could, could just see, we, we could define how many parking spaces exactly. that they, yes. they 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 wind up taking. You know, which gives the the commercial people who are having trouble because their customers come, they can't find a parking space, so they just drive away and they don't. Come. Right. They and then the other else. the other thing is that's going to add time, right? Because they're going to have to they're going to need to do like a traffic study for the board to be able to show. I don't know. They need a traffic study. Exactly. Yeah. they if part of our, part of our consideration is dealing with a waiver of parking spaces. If it was a 75 spot lot, yeah, that kind of may want to put in a solar canopy over your friend's parking lot, yeah, uh, and they lose uh 15 percent, they lose roughly 10 parking spaces, right? I, I think we're going to need to uh, study to determine if that's too much, otherwise, it's arbitrary, yeah. But that's got nothing to do with traffic, that just has to do with the number of parking spaces. As a parking study, I apologize, yes. Yeah. Yeah, a parking study. Right, right. It still requires an engineer. It takes time and it costs money. Yeah, but I think that you're. Uh, you think but it's a think reasonable that, thing. I would think that they would come in, and, and they'd say, "Okay, there's there's seventy five spaces in the lot. We're going to wind up taking ten spaces to put this in, and the neighbors, you know, it, it's a public hearing, right? To say right. plan review. Yeah. The neighbors have an opportunity to to come in to say, you know, we can't afford to lose ten spaces and in that parking lot, which prompts us to, to say, you know, gee, can you redesign it so that you're only losing right. seven spaces instead of okay. 10 spaces? You right. know, how are we going to get around this? And uh, they don't have to do a study. They just need to sit down with their architect and figure out I how think to do it. a matter of engineering, we want to know what that loss is and not rely on, you know, I would want the board at the time to have an empirical understanding of what the impact could be. Yeah, but you know, if they come in, they should have is if they come in and say we're taking 10 spaces and nobody complains, when that happens, you we wind up approving the plan. Well, I think it'll be I'm not I'm not even sure to be honest, you know, yeah. um that they take up that much space. And the, the so I mean you go you go to REI and in, in Natick. Yeah. And it sits between the parking the spaces. spaces, right? So that's it's, why that's why yeah. as we get closer to the stage of drafting a bylaw, I'd like to hear from and take testimony from our town engineer, right, to be able to validate that, right, and as a result, be able to you know go away with uh, you know not require parking study. But I need the you know this need is data. the first step. It's a really important step. We've got a lot of work to do ahead of us, and that's going to, you know, that it will come down yeah. Yeah. the process. When I mean, we had the project on Kendrick Street, yes. they came in, told us, you know, actually with very few parking spaces, yeah, I think I think they only lost two spaces. All right. I can't I remember offhand how many Wasn't spaces. that on the roof? That yes. Already? So that was another another one that Dave mentioned. Oh, but I mean, what could still lose spaces on the roof? Yes, on the ground. That's right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. To support the structure. That was another area that, that David suggested we look at, since there's a lot of interest in putting solar on parking structures, not just on parking garage, uh, parking lots. Are there height restrictions that are limiting limiting that over them? Uh, he did mention that there's a couple of good benefits to having solar on the rooftops. So for one, it really helps with snow melt. So they the snow can sit on the structure. It doesn't sit on the ground. They don't have to plow it and lose a bunch of spaces during the during the winter. The other thing is they often close those roofs in the winter because of those piles of snow. Partly because of safety concerns with with um, individuals going up there and sliding down the down the little mountains and possibly going over the edge, so uh, he mentioned that that was another consideration for why you might want to consider. And, and I really love the fact that, that they don't have if they are using up they they don't have salt salting laid down on the top of it. 
and snow is and then plowed up all the, all yeah. this hazardous waste, essentially hazardous waste. Right. And, and the solar canopy is just take care of that. It's now just clean water to a large extent with no soft being thrown around. Except it does melt. Yeah, it does salt, melt. Salt is, salt is not, salt is not a, a salt is not firmly to me. No, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with yeah, you on, on the salt. I'm, I'm disagreeing on the concept that it eliminates the need for all that stuff. It eliminates the need for salt on top of the parking structure because the snow is running on top of solar panels. It just melts more naturally. Well, as long as you don't have the salt on the solar panels. Right yeah, right, so. yeah. yeah. So the um, next slide is just uh, adding definitions zoning for small and medium was another recommendation that came came out of our discussion is that they're not defined today. Um, there are different ways you can define them. Uh, square footage or it, you know the, the kilowatt output of the, the array. Uh, it would help clarify the permitting process. You know, today it's not blocking the small, the medium. I'm not even sure if you would want to do a medium size. That would probably be um, you know, potentially a commercial property where they have, uh, you know, a field where they, they might be able to put some solar panels in. Uh, but we'd probably want to look at how to define small and medium. Uh, 25 kilowatt system is typically defined as the upper bound of a small system. Uh, and I can't remember, how, was that like a thousand square feet, 25 kilowatts? 25 kilowatts. You know, five, you see panels are 40, 40 square feet. A thousand is 50, no, a thousand is. I don't, I don't, okay. I don't know. Okay. It's your typical, you know, large residential house. Um, the recommendation was that the small systems be as a right subject to the lot coverage limits and that the medium be um, as a right with site plan review. Um, because they're larger, you might want to put in things like screening requirements, setback requirements, um, signage, safety components, et cetera. And also, this would this also um, correspond to institutional buildings like this, like civic buildings in the town? Potentially, potentially. Like we're saying commercial, but I just not because I mean some of the schools, like let's say Newman, has a big parking lot where you could put an array. That's so. actually, yeah, that's one of the active projects that I think um, the school department would like to move on, but they don't yet have the zoning to do for uh, one of the things. The solar canopies over the Newman lot. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it would re schools, right? So just I'm just trying to think if we if we do this, we want to make sure that those they don't have barriers either, right? And so we would need to amend the zoning, but I law in order in order to put a solar canopy at the human law. That's my understanding, because there's there's no definition of of the size of the system or the requirements. Um, we don't we don't really talk about solar canopies at all in our bylaw. Right, yeah. We don't talk about ground based at all. We don't talk about a white. Like, do it is kind of you know my thought. Yeah. <laughs> well, we don't because you, you, you say we don't have anything to allow it. So maybe we don't have anything to prevent. I don't know what that bylaw has to do with parking uh, lots. You know, maybe if you're if you're zoned for a parking lot, that's all you're zoned for. I don't know. One question I, is, yeah. uh, you know, to what extent could we exempt municipalities, a municipality, from some of the longer processes? That would save the town a lot of money, save a ton of time, and reduce the barrier for uh, you know for adoption on more of our municipal buildings. I'm not. For Let the I'm record not, show that I am smiling because I have been on the board a lot longer than you have, yes. <laughs> and I'm going to say that we can have more problems dealing with the town than we can with private contractors, I, I, and I yeah. don't want to just give the town exemption. I'll say that Hank Half was in our meeting, and Dave Roach was in our meeting, and neither of them expressed an interest in reducing the restrictions around, you know, like having us carve out for municipal. The same issues are going to come up. You're going to still have stormwater management, safety, you're going to have parking. Um, I get all that. We just so. have all the expertise in the house right. to be able to address that. But I'm not, and I'm just to be clear, I'm not advocating that that be done. I'm just raising the question would that ultimately eliminate some of the barriers for municipal uh, implementation in a faster track? That's Possible. All. I think if you did the as of right with, um, site plan review, 
you'd probably find they have most of the information that they you would need in that site plan review already at their fingertips because they've done a lot of these studies. They've been looking at this right. for a few years. Yeah. Um, I think what they really just want is clarity on yeah. on whether or not we're we can do it. sitting here thinking more, more than once as we're talking, and it's going to be fascinating if they want to put a solar array or, or, or solar on the roof at Emory Grover. Uh, <laughs> I think solar has been ruled out. No, that's, 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 not, that's out not a good candidate. candidate. I think, I think it's been ruled out. Originally, there was going to be a solar canopy, and I'm not sure if that's been carved out yet, but the roof, I think, has been ruled out as, as a candidate for... Uh, for also, one thing, it's a historic structure, and I've got uh, significant funding uh, from the Community it's Preservation it's Act right, right. because yeah, of the preservation... Much of the historic structure. structure that's really... The shell. Wrapped. It's really, it's really the shell. Yeah. And the facade that's staying. Yeah. yeah but it's that's, that's, the it's, rest uh, of it is pretty much new construction. Yeah. I mean, there's been discussions about canopies at the high school, but uh, there's been concerns about having fireworks at the high school and a solar canopy. Doesn't mix oh, very well funny. for the for the emergency <laughs> equipment. So that's probably not a, a venue that'll get um, prioritized. Newman seems like one of the most logical ones. Yeah. Um, and there's also the potential to, to put electric bus charging over there in the future. We're also that's talking good. about at some point re, 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 rebuilding Mitchell. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. Pollard. Yeah. So those could be kind of actually factored in at the design yeah, stage. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. yeah. So um, the next next few slides I'll, I'll race through just real quick because um, it's just you know recommending that we talked about this already separate out the height and setback restrictions for commercial and rooftop uh, installations. Uh, below is just I had already highlighted this language um, in an earlier slide, so we won't spend any more time on that one. And then the other thing is we pulled together a bunch of resources. It sounds like, Lee, you already have access to that DOER 2014 model zoning. Um, the MAPC has a climate smart zoning and permitting playbook. Yes. So what municipal should, municipalities should be thinking of? I've read that and thought that that's, uh, there are a number of those initiatives. Right. So uh, yeah. Natasha's working group was looking at those as well okay. as they looked at other towns. And, and that's why, um, you know, looking at the action A allowed by right, the installation operation of net zero enabling technologies was was one of the yep. um, actions that came. Here we are. Uh, model is 10 years old. Have they not updated? What did they? I haven't seen anything new. Um, it's Okay, how long it, it takes us to change I, zoning. Right. I didn't see too much in it that um, <laughs> seemed the, like it would be dated. Because I got four big zoning changes too. Uh, pretty cool. I don't know. Think about how large our zoning bylaw is. It is a very large book. Pioneer Valley, the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission also has a very uh, nice yeah. SOAR best practices document, which I've shared with the with the board. Um, and then the community planning for solar toolkit from UMass Clean en Energy Extension. So you all have access to those files now. Thank um, you for I've, those have been updated uh, and included in our package. And then on the next slide, um, just because I'm a bit of a, a geek, um, I decided to take the DOER uh, model language and see if I could figure <laughs> out what would get pulled into. And so I created a word file from that language. Um, so it, it's kind of a stake in the ground on some of the topics we've talked about already. Um, you'll see just examples. Um, and I thought if that might help the committee visualize where to take this, um, it would be useful. Um, and we use that as, as a framework for our discussion of the CAPC meeting last month. So that's zoning and permitting. And that was mostly what I wanted to cover. But you guys also seem to want to talk about the building codes, and I'd be happy to talk about that if you want to. Yes, but they, have... I am interested, and in, I have uh, interest in uh, multi comparison of multifamily and uh, commercial new construction yeah. under the code. Um, when we get to it, great. I have a... yes, yeah, question on the zoning and permitting. Yes, and for your respective uh, subcommittees as well. Before we get into uh, some of the detail of the codes. We have, a, we have a list of, I think, three specific actions that we're looking to take. I'm looking forward to October. Are you looking to get each of the, uh, take action and uh, with three separate zoning bylaw changes for October? 
So let me answer that in two parts. Okay. Um, part one is this is the initial recommendations of the CAPC. Uh, we are in the process now of finalizing our climate action plan, uh, and we anticipate having the final draft ready for, for everybody by early fall before town meeting. I fully expect that this will remain the top action from the planning permitting. Let me phrase it another way, if I may. Yes. If we want, if we want to make some zoning changes in October, right, which I would like to do. We're going to need that when uh, we when will we need the language for the bylaw changes in the beginning of August? You know, you'll need it in August. You'll need to have finalized what you're going to do in August. Okay. okay. So, what's your question? So, is that something that's not that really that looking at, or I mean, it sounds to me like um, uh, your committee is really looking towards next year's annual town meeting before we have language ready to so before town town meeting to change our bylaws. Yeah, so let me let me clarify, I think, our purpose. Uh, as an advisory body, we're not experts in, in zoning and bylaw uh, language. So this was our, our attempt to kind of frame up what we but think. You have we have an audio on your we page. do. <laughs> <laughs> um, the if thank you. Law, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think. What do you need, right? Yeah. <laughs> Don't have gene. I would. Gene, think, gene. I would think if there is interest it's amongst this board on working on zoning language, it's something we would prioritize working with you on. I don't think we can work on it independently, though. To be no, honest, no, yeah. I but if it were prioritized by this board and you needed resources, we would find the resources to work with you on it. Yeah, but the question is, I guess. Adam, that we're really asking is, is this something that can really be carved out from your overall climate recommendations that you're not really going to have ready until the fall? I don't see it that way. I see it, I see it this way. There are two or three actions. We've got three months, three and a half months to turn those actions into specific legislation. So we're ready on fire in uh, in August in time for a track for October. And we can, I, we can prioritize a certain number of those to get it into that track. There will be other, you know, as they complete their report, there will be a number of other action items that will take longer and will be more complicated. And, and may have nothing to do with planning. Some may right. not, but yeah. and some will. But so, this will be one of the top six. This this is considered a, an enabling action that opens the door to other actions, right? So if we really want to get residential, I'm sorry, list commercial, we want commercial entities to really take advantage of a lot of the federal and state incentives to put solar on their properties. Um, we should be removing the restrictions as soon as possible. So so if we're really talking that the center is on the rooftop and part in solar canyons. Those are the two. Those, Those are the two big ones, right? Those are the two big ones. Yeah. And, and we, I mean, the, there was a whole list. E each group has has five or six items that with really one or two that mm -hmm. we're recommending as either low hanging fruit or something that's imminent that we really need to review. So mm -hmm. there's a bigger plan for this exactly. and a bigger master plan for this, right? I mean, I think or we're, we're it, recommending in the future. It is. Um, but but the one, this, this is a low hanging fruit a little bit. It is low hanging fruit. And one way I would think of the, what the plan, the climate action plan is, it's a roadmap from 2023 to 2050 net zero. There are things that we can do this year, next year, next five years, next 10 years. This is definitely one of the ones you can do next, this year. We could right. do this year get it done, get it out of the way. Yeah. MAPC recommends it as one of the first things that you tackle because it starts to unlock a lot of the other types of programs and, and policies and processes that you might want to put in place as a municipality. So um, again, this is a, a recommendation of the board. Um, the planning board needs to decide whether or not they want to prioritize this for the next year um, or the next few months. And if so, you know, we're there to support you. The other thought that I had is I'd like to utilize our existing site plan criteria and special permit criteria. And this is not going to be an immediate action, but hopefully for May, uh, possibly October 24, 2024, but I'd like to do it by May 
where we modify in some, in some of our commercial districts, the floor area ratio. And in order to achieve that as an inducement, they would have additional other criteria to meet. And if that is a legally sound methodology and approach, that they meet those standards and they might be able to get a bonus in some dimensional regulations, either by waiver or by additional factors. Well, that's certainly a conversation that we have, but that's certainly not going to happen this year. Yeah. I said, so 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 I you want to modify some of our commercial area zones to say increase the floor area ratio allowed as of right in general you want to see that happen maybe increase the amount of floor area ratio that's allowed by special permit and then say i mean let's say we increase a floor area ratio from 0.75 to 1.2 um, as of right and then you say however if you have solar if you add solar to your design then your floor area ratio as as of right goes up as to 1.4. No, I not quite, because we have to be careful that we can't impose the higher level of energy code on a by right scenario. Well, but, this is, asked, but this isn't by right. This is well, by special Paul, permit. I'm just responding. Yeah, but, but the but Paul specifically saying as a special permit, as an incentive saying it started by talking about a by right. I'm addressing the distinction. Yeah. Okay. Can I continue? Sure. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm not quite characterizing it that way. I'm making a distinction. By right would continue. We have, we may have a, you know, we have a certain criteria now that if they'd like to achieve uh, an FAR that was greater on a special permit basis. Yeah. On that basis, the addition, you know, we would add additional criteria that they would have to meet certain PERS ratings as a result, certain energy efficiency ratings. And if we so you're reducing their ability to get a special permit increase in FAR um, based upon whether or not they meet the, the climate change. Requirements. Not quite. I, I kind of see it in three steps. We have buy right now. Yeah. We have special permit now. Right. And if they want a little bonus above that, I don't know what that would be. And I'm not necessarily advocating it. You basically want to create it an could be 10 or 15 percent. Exactly. So as, as okay. an inducement, yep. then they would no. have that, that higher we, we level. Do that. We, we do that with a few things. Now. Exactly. So that's the model. So but to be clear, it's, I know that's not a simple thing. There is going to be a, you know, there's going to be a ton of conversation about increasing the floor area ratio. There could be other impacts. There are other impacts. There are other considerations too with other dimensional regulations. I'm just saying that as an example, that may, that may be one way that we could utilize and, and achieve and, and, and achieve. The thing, and the thing that comes to my mind immediately is the pushback that we got at our hearings on Muzzy that were mostly about floor area ratio. Yeah. It, you know, People it, are very it, concerned it, with density. You're totally yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I but, and so that may not be the only dimensional regulation. There could be others. Yeah. So I think that there are, but I think it's a conversation worth having because there's a difference. But between, basically, I hear you saying that you're basically giving a carrot. Correct. Yeah. To achieve incentives for, for incentives these things. To, to achieve sort of climate, the climate change. I, I'm calling it climate change, but you know, right. Yeah. In order to achieve a greater public good, right? Yeah, that's the where an increase something, an increase floor area ratio, an increase. Um, so, uh, but I have I have some to, to yeah. clarify, but not taking anything away, so that we now have. Uh, a special permit for an increased floor area ratio. We're not taking that away. We're saying if you even do this, you could get it even more. Even right. Yeah. But I think we also want to be we also want to establish 
and understand what the impacts of those additional inducements would have beyond achieving the public good of uh, achieving you know, a net zero, for instance, standard or a higher energy rating. In other words, like you, know, like you were alluding to with Muzzy, there are impacts to increased floor area ratio and density that you said as well. And I, I'm mindful of that, I'm sensitive to that. We, I'm just saying it's a conversation I wanna have because the, out, the product of that conversation is gonna get us that much closer to achieving these goals. Well, we're also, I mean, but we're also static in time. We're not static in time. We're, 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 we are here now. One year, two years from now, we're gonna be in a different location, different thought process of perhaps already different requirements already as far as what we need to accomplish to reach our 2050 goals. Can I take that point? Because there's go, a good segue. Go with the segue. So there's two two thoughts that I've been as I've been listening to this conversation. Um, so I participate on something called the Building Electric uh, Electrification Accelerator, mm -hmm. and it's a uh, it's a loose group of um, municipal employees, as well as committee members, as well as board members across Massachusetts who are focusing on how do you accelerate the the decarbonization of buildings. So they meet monthly. We have a listserv. There's constantly ideas going around. Um, last year, a number of municipalities tried to pass net zero electric only building codes at the local level mandates. Mm -hmm. um, those were all shot down by the attorney general mm -hmm. um, as usurping state authority over this over the building energy codes. And there's been a few different flavors of those that have all been shot down. It doesn't look like the new attorney general is going to have any different opinion than the old attorney general because the old attorney general is now our governor. So I suspect that there's going to be a lot of attention paid to any municipalities that try to move outside of their um, their remits on these things. Uh, there might be some ideas that come from that, and I would suggest that you know if there are any ideas, we can float them through that and see if anybody else has tried something and had any success with it. But the other possibilities, it might not be necessary. Um, so what the state did is it looked at our decarbonization roadmap. And they said, under current law, there isn't a pathway to decarbonize our buildings. So the stretch energy code is not going to get us there. All of the modeling, all the engineering, and looked at it and they said, yeah, we won't, we'll fall way short. What we need is a new code that can be applied for new construction. So as we have the natural turnover of buildings and new structures going in, we can have require them to be built at a much higher uh, efficiency than the existing ones. And so that's what this new specialized opt-in code is designed to do. And should Needham adopt that, it might so make right. some of these ideas, um, which are good, um, unnecessary. Um, so if you if you want, I can go through the codes a little bit and we can just understand what they are because it's it's helpful. Would, but I just want to raise one yeah, sure. question to Adam, which is the ideas that you're raising are are those really is the Council of Economic Advisors a, a, a good place to have that discussion? Good time, absolutely. That's right. We have a clearer sense of but for one thing, you you've got you you've got construction people. That's right. On the council, like that's right. Advisors and you know, the, the state developers. So what I would like to do is get to a clear framework, and then, and then effectively have you know Stephen as chair come into the um, the CEA, so we can have a discussion about it, and then understand how what inducements there could be and what the impacts would be, and start to and see how that impacts part of the overall discussion mm -hmm. that the select board would have a comment, you know, and, uh, the engineering department, public safety may have comments. And then as the planning board, and we're ultimately resolving what steps to take. And if we're gonna make any zoning changes that we've heard from all of these you know, uh, groups that are directly related to it, like the building department, like the CEA, for example. Uh, that's a very good idea. It's, Exactly, part of my master plan. Part uh, of whose master plan? Let's, let's let Steve move on. Yeah. So, uh, can we bring the slide deck back? I'm sorry. 
Um, so I just want to make sure that we we level set on this because there definitely is um, potential for confusion between these different codes. Mm -hmm. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, so just to reiterate, um, Needham's already adopted the stretch code. The stretch code is an above code appendix. Uh, it was designed when it came out uh, to result in cost effects that affected the construction that is more energy efficient than what is built under the base code. And that was developed around the time the Green Communities Program was, was, was uh, brought forth at the state level. It was a requirement for any municipality to be brought into the Green Communities Program to adopt the stretch code. Green Communities allows municipalities to apply for grants for things like um, efficiency upgrades on buildings, light replacements, EV purchases, and the like. So we adopted that at the May 2019 town meeting, and over 300 Massachusetts cities and towns have now adopted it. There are only 351. One. There's yeah. some Massachusetts. There's there's only one town. Pretty up. damn good. Yeah, really so is. very good. <laughs> yeah, we were like, yeah, we were like, 20, 15 years ago, and we were like, <laughs> <laughs> we were like an island. We were the hole in the donut for a long time, but the important thing is we got there. We did it. We got there. We got there. <laughs> It took two swings at the, the, the pitch, but we got there. Um, in 2022, then Massachusetts updated the stretch code. Um, and so again, the base code basically over time comes up, catches up to the stretch code, and then they, they push the stretch code forward again. So the base code today is effectively what the stretch, stretch code was. The key changes that they made to the stretch code is there are stricter efficiency standards, um, HERS ratings or passive house for both new construction and alterations. I'm going to say that very specifically because I want to distinguish this from the new opt-in code. The stretch code applies to both new construction and alterations. Uh, and some types of renovations must meet, meet higher HERS ratings. Uh, new construction also requires ventilation and heat capture because they're tighter construction now. Uh, you need to be able to keep the air exchange going, but you don't want to just throw the hot air out or the cold air out. You want to capture that heat or cooling. So those are requirements. Um, Homes are now required to be wired for EV. Um, and then new that's new homes, I should say. What is EV? I'm sorry, electric vehicles, electric vehicles. Okay. Um, and then high ventilation buildings like labs and hospital, hospitals have um, have some exemptions, right? They don't have to be built to the same standards. Go to the next slide. So there's a bit of an eye chart, but I'll try to walk through it. Um, so um, basically, this is looking at what the maximum HERS rating is. Uh, for new construction and alterations under several different um, building. Lower the better. Lower is better, yes. So 100 being like the, the old standard house, uh, roughly a 52 is going to be about half as much energy to run that house, um, et cetera. So there's it's different ways. All you, kinds of buildings. These are, this is right now we're looking at, um, I believe this is, just residential, but I, I could double oh, check that. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's different codes for, for large um, commercial. So- And this would be say single family residential. Right, so for example, that's okay. exactly right. So single, single family residential building with fossil fuels under the new, uh, under the current stretch code, they need a HERS rating maximum of 55, um, updated to 52 on, June uh, through June 30th to 2024. And then it comes down to 42 in July of 2024. So you can see they're, they're ratcheting that down. So if you have solar um, uh, on your roof, you get a little bit of a break under the current stretch code and that goes away under the new stretch code. So you no longer get a break for solar. Um, if you have all electric, construction or solar plus electric, you can see under the current stretch code, um, you've got uh, a break for solar. You can be less efficient with solar on the roof. Under the new stretch code next July, there will be no uh, benefit for having solar on your roof. So they're, they're concerned about a um, variety of different ways that these things were being gamed. And so now it's just focus on uh, highly efficient buildings. For alterations, there's slightly higher um, HERS ratings overall, um, but you can see you, you still get some benefits for putting solar under the under the new stretch code for alterations, additions, and change of use. So, so that was the stretch code. Um, 
what I mentioned before was that when the state was looking at the even the stretch code improvements, it's still no path. There's still no pathway to a net zero um, building environment, uh, and so th that was get what gave way to the opt-in specialized code, which was also passed by the, the state legislature last year. So this was introduced new. Um, it does require an affirmative affirmative vote by town meeting to pass. So it doesn't just come with the stretch code, which we have to, you have to opt into it. It only applies to new construction. And then once passed, it, there's a six month waiting period before it goes in. Uh, it has to go in uh, effect on a January one or a July one date. So it's at least six months. Bringing that to front of town meeting, is that something that you would be referred to as a select board? It is. This board? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, select board would have to decide whether or not to bring this forward. So. Um, so that's that's what the code is at a high level. Um, if you're interested, um, there's lots of really fun charts to look through. So these are dwellings, um, new construction. Again, remember only new construction doesn't impact existing renovations. Dwellings up to 4,000 square feet that are all electric have a minimum efficiency at HERS rating of 45 or um, there's other pathways, um, which I won't get into in this, this meeting. Uh, it does require full electrification, one parking space, uh, wired for electric vehicles, renewables option. Um, so that's if you have an all electric home. You can, however, put fossil fuel in a new home under the new specialized code. However, it also requires you to pre-wire it for electric. So if you wanted to put that gas furnace in there or you want to put a gas um, kitchen in, you would also have to wire it for future conversion to a heat pump in the case of the heating and cooling and um, all electric appliances in the kitchen. If we, I mean, you'd run your refrigeration lines, you'd run your refrigeration lines and your electric lines. Pre-wired, you don't have to, so pre-wired for uh, the panel and the electricity. They're not asking you to put in the you heat pump the unit. The heat pump yeah. unit wouldn't, yeah, your furnace would be what it is. Um, and I think typically, you know, if you have a ducted system, you can you can convert over to a ducted heat pump heat pump system relatively easily. But what they didn't want to have happen is that the person who wants to do that heat pump has to go and upgrade their panel, has to go upgrade um, the amp, you know, the the, um, the the wiring throughout the house to be able to handle that load. So they want you to manage the load up front yeah, in the built of yeah. building of the house. I noticed several of the slides use the phrase highest core or PHI. What's that? Passive house. Passive house standards. Yeah. Oh. So uh, generally, it's is if the uh, geothermal it, amount of energy the house produces equals the amount of energy the house uses, it gets a passive house standard. Yeah, yeah. When you basically most of the um, right now we're, I'm doing a passive house in um, in the city of Austin. And it's basically wood framed because you don't want to have um, the transfer of cool or heat from the, from the inside the building to outside. It, it, it's just more strict when it comes to all of the detailing. Um, so you're basically creating just a more efficient system all throughout. So, um, and it in our case, it has solar as well. So, okay, this wasn't familiar with the phrase. Yes. Yeah. So the HERS rating is if you don't, you know, if you're using more energy yeah. than you it's, produce. Yeah. You could use a HERS rating. So they they give the the construction uh, companies builders different pathways to achieve code um, under this. Um, and in each of these cases, you'll see dwellings over four thousand square feet. Um, the um, all electric again HERS is is forty five, just like the, the dwellings under four thousand feet. But large dwellings over four thousand feet now they're actually requiring a HERS rating of zero. Mm -hmm. Um, so the bigger the homes, typically the more energy intensive they are. So the um, the new code is much stricter with um, with those structures. And really, a lot of this in all the other community is being led by municipalities, right? So the city of Boston, if you're getting funding from the mayor's office of housing (MOH), it requires you to be to be passive house, and it requires certain things. I mean, we'll pay for your construction and the five single family home. If it's for affordable housing, which is what we're doing right now, it's affordable housing, they will give a grant 
for mul for multifamily. Not for multifamily. Yeah. yeah. So I, I guess it, it, right now this is not the law. This is kind of municipalities are opting yes. to give incentives to yeah. do it. So it's something for us to think about as as we think about, especially with MBTA communities. One of the things that I wanted to bring up is this, this also, anything that we do for this that could also be beneficial to the MBTA communities. Could, and, this, and also- Regarding you know, density or whatever it is that we have to do. And also, and also um, for, uh, for the need, uh, for, uh, need of the housing authority and their redevelopment. Right. Well, and that's what I was getting at by increasing, you know, if there was a bonus on density, for instance, you know, Gene, we're talking about something like uh, 18 units an acre by right for compliance with the MBTA communities. If they got an extra 15% and we can get an extra, you know, an extra six units in a building, you know, and by doing, you know, as an inducement to, you know, get to a, a higher energy efficient building, and that could be seen as a great boon to the town. Yeah, and I don't think that would be units. a problem under the uh, right. restriction in the MBTA community's guidelines that you can't have stricter uh, environmental standards right. for multifamily right. housing than for commercial uses. Right. right. And um, I do want to talk about that when we get to this slide. Yes, we're just about there, I think, okay. in the next one. So looking at it holistically, I think when we're making these recommendations, I think is, is useful not to say that it would discourage us from doing one or the other, you know, but just looking at it holistically, I think is, is beneficial. Yeah. Um, I, you know, there's, there's pros and cons of going the zoning route versus the building code route as well. So I think, you know, yeah, I mean, that's the other thing to just keep in mind that you could be trying to bake a cake over here and the cake might come out of the oven over here. Yeah. yeah <laughs> I'm, I'm, a little, yeah. I'm a little concerned with giving stuff away right now. So. Oh, I'm, what immediately comes to mind is if we've got one of these MBTA communities that borders on a single family residence uh, zone, and we're saying, you know, we're going to give you an extra six, one third more units, an extra six units as of, as of right, if you do this, the, the, the people who live in the single family units are going to be standing room only right. in this room. Right. And especially since we, we could potentially get to there. If you go to the next slide, yeah. I think the next slide has I mean, them all be. Yeah, we'll get there without, we can get there without giving stuff away. Yeah. The next slide uh, is, uh, yeah. Okay, so here's where the multifamily comes in. So over 12,000 square feet, um, you've got um, different pathways as well. I don't have the actual ratings here. But um, just note that under the specialized code, if they do a fossil fuel heated or um, kitchens um, in those multifamilies, they still need to pre-wire them for all electric. And so from a large sense, um, the adopting the code becomes a, a, a very strong incentive for builders to go all electric from the outset. Now, I did sit in on Wellesley's um, Wellesley had a public forum on the specialized code and they had builders, high performance home, um, builder, multifamily builder, um, and a passive house builder. Um, and so in each case, they said that the building construction is roughly about 1% 1, 1 more. Uh, there's a learning curve. So if, you, if you're, it's your first time building an all electric unit, um, you have to change your designs, you have to change your building methods, you need to change your suppliers, potentially there's cost. Uh, but over time, these builders say they've all been able to get their building costs for an all electric home within about 1%. So it's not a huge- It's not a huge burden. It's not a huge burden. It's not not a huge burden. burden. It does require them to learn new design methods, building methods, You know, possibly bring up, pick up new um, skills in their labor force. But by and large, the companies that are doing this now are doing it at a very competitive price. Yeah, I mean, one reason we have to kind of, I'm not going to say go hand in hand with the state, I don't really because they need to say that, but we have to, there has to be a collaboration, as I say, with Eversource in, in the state or Eversource. Right, for capacity. We, we have to have the capacity. Yeah. We're never going to get there if we don't have the capacity. It is impossible. 
we have to have the collaboration. You're right coming now. next Thursday, right? Okay. Yes, I am, young man. <laughs> so we have Eversource is going to be there. We have Eversource coming so to the Climate is... Action Plan Committee next Thursday oh, nice. to well, talk about capacity. When I first saw this, and also um, the net zero path was commercial and construction, I said, gee, it's hard to compare them. Yes. Um, and I was thinking, seeing it through the lens of the MBTA community's guidelines, which say um, um, cannot, uh, requirements have to apply uniformly. Uh, these are examples of requirements that would be deemed to be inconsistent with as of right use. Um, a requirement that multifamily housing meet higher energy efficiency standards than other uses. So right. under our zoning, we can't do that. Right. But it occurs to me, as I thought about it, I said, this isn't under our zoning. No, this the is the code. state building code. Right. right. So yeah. it's not a problem at all. No, it, yeah. been, that, that's what the attorney general is basically saying when she struck down a number of these local zoning rules um they uh they're saying you know by law i can't remember the legal you you're a lawyer you know but when the state has been given the authority for something the towns and cities cannot usurp it yeah they have the state sovereignty something there's a word for it i i just know that there was uh they were they were struck Pre down. preemption preemption okay i'll take that that sounds correct <laughs> to me as well sure so Stephen, what you're saying is that some of these things might be happening anyway and so we might we might look into the other things that are not occurring, right? To right. Bring to right. Town meeting rather than the ones that are already occurring that are gonna you're gonna be grandfathered into doing anyway. Right. Now, well, and there's possible five years from now there might actually be like a, an all electric code. Who knows? I think it actually works the other way. If okay. I can digress um, into something that's more political, like that, I guess, um, because you see it in the sense that we. And a lot of the things the towns have to do, they have to then do by way of home rule petition, which means they have to then go to right. the legislature right. for permission. Mm -hmm. Cities and towns are creatures of state government. They only have the right to do what the state government tells them they can do. That's it's exactly. not like they have rights that state government can say, hey, wait a minute, we've saved that for ourselves. It's more like, we didn't give you permission to do that, so you can't do it. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So uh, there are... Oh. Go ahead, Chief. That's okay. I was going to argue about the home rule amendment. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You're a municipal lawyer, so you, so, can, you can tell me I'm all wrong. In the, uh, I'd like to get a sense of when your committee and your subcommittees wrap up. You, you said in the summer, is that right? So, yeah, so we are now in the process of working with the consultant to take the raw material that the working groups created and pull that into uh, a process that ends in a climate action plan. So there will be a public process over the next few months um, that will invite comment on every section. And then um, ultimately, we're going to come up with a short list of prioritized actions. That Across we, the town department. And this will be a recommendation. Oh. It'll be presented to the select board and other boards as well as, as relevant. Um, and that's what it'll be. It'll be the recommendation. It'll then be incumbent on the relative boards and committees. We're back up. Sorry. When, when is that complete? So the final, final, we're, we're shooting for September, October. Yep. And this Climate Plan Action Committee is ongoing. It is ongoing. We're chartered through next spring, next April. There's a possibility that there may April be 24. April 2024. Um, and part of that's because they're also we're also helping already. So we've already taken one action, just to give you a precedent here. Um, town yeah. meeting authorized the select board to begin a community electricity aggregation plan to design one. Um, a cons RFP has been sent out to hire a consultant on that point. Um, that plan will be developed over the next several months. There's a whole process with public hearings in town, as well as uh, going before state um, DOER, uh, as well as uh, I can't remember the, was it DPC or DPU, DPU, uh, which also have public hearings. Uh, so that whole process can take a year or two before a CEA comes into place. And so one of the first things the Climate Action Plan did do is because if you remember that chart at the beginning with all the dirty sources, electricity was one of the big three. A municipal aggregation plan can help us 
decarbonize our electricity faster. It allows us to, as a town, to negotiate a contract on behalf of all residents and all businesses, as well as the town, if you want. To Not just on price, but on source. Source and price, right? And so it's basically collective buying power. We go out and we, 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 we submit bids, uh, or solicit bids, I should say. So we've already taken one action. So the second action could be a warrant article to change, amend some of our bylaws. And then another will be a general bylaw change in time, for instance, for a potentially a tree bylaw after we strike up another uh, reiteration of the bylaw kind of tree. Yeah, tree all, all of these are potential. Yeah. So it's similar to the to the housing master plan where right now there are different groups that could push forward different initiatives, and so I think it's the same thing as kind of understanding will there be someone that will be accountable for all of it or are the different boards going to be accountable for it this is kind of the same thing that we're going to have with yeah. the CAPC I don't it. think the CAPC wants any board that might be entertaining an action to wait for the CAPC right and the same thing with the housing because we don't really have a we, we don't have someone who's who's running we're trying to yeah. figure out who's going to take the bits and pieces and yeah I mean, if it fits with the priorities of CAPC, I think we'll be there to lend a voice and say, yeah, this is actually a priority, priority action coming out of on the climate action right. plan. So, but I don't think anybody needs to wait for us to finish that plan. When do when do you, are you guys on the same subcommittees? Or are you no, we're actually subcommittees? separate. So when do you uh, finalize your- We've already- They've already, yeah, they've already, done yeah, done we, all, they've already all the subcommittees out. working groups have already submitted their- Perfect. So, can you send that to the planning board, what those are, so you yeah. can get a global sense? Sure, absolutely. Of, of that, I think that would be helpful. Yeah. And then as we continue with another planning session, we'll be able to plot through um, uh, you know, some specific action that we can take for October and for May next year, and then Works for October maybe. the following year, whatever we need to do to send that across a number of these and, items. And Adam, for the zoning one, I remember, yeah. I, you know, I kind of gave the, the cliff notes of the two that we were recommending, right. but I think it, I think, you know, for the benefit of everyone, it's good to see. Yeah, the whole, the whole exactly. Picture. Yeah. Great minds. Uh, so that's very helpful. Thank you very much for coming Thank in. Thank you for your time. Thank you for had the zoning bylaw change from my zoning. Yes. And you wanted to make an amendment. I wanted to make an amendment. I, I would have been wrong. You, I promised you, <laughs> I said, I wanted to see it townwide. Yes. And I said, I promised you we would work on that. And I'm glad I kept my promise. There you go. <laughs> you're, you're welcome. I'm, you're glad, welcome. I'm glad nobody picked up the amendment because I think in retrospect, it probably would have been shot down by uh, the attorney general. I think, uh, right, yeah. I think the, the property owners would have challenged it and we would have lost. Right. Given what I now know, uh, but at the time, it seemed like a good idea. It seemed like a good idea. Well, you brought it up enough to make an impact. Exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah. So that's what. To start the conversation. So with the with the muzzy zoning, I know that some had thought that, for instance, you know, housing was included just as a you know as a whim to try and get the whole thing passed, which it genuinely was not. But from that. And then, you know, there was there was an article to try and uh, amend to um, uh, to kind of boost production for housing at that site. Housing, you know, there were two priorities that we had talked about, affordable housing that came out of Muzzy mm -hmm. and sustainable action or climate action. So uh, it takes a while to get things through, as we all know, in a municipal process. But I'm very happy to see the work that you know Natasha and Jean you've done on affordable housing and that and Artie, and Artie as well and on the uh, you know, CFOC, yeah you know and uh, and working towards these action steps I think will be uh, you know these these are the, our major transformational changes for the town right so thank you very much for your commitment and for coming in tonight thank you for your time this is a great conversation i've been a great deal from the presentation hope you yeah. appreciate it thank you all right thank you very kindly thank you thank you so the next item on our agenda really i think the last item is a report from our planning director and planning board members lee do you have anything to report in for alex you're muted lee lee you're muted
It, uh, yes, Adam, unless maybe you want to take the lead on updating the planning board on our meeting with the finance committee last week. Um, Adam uh, and I went, went to the finance committee um, to present the zoning articles um, and actually the article that we're asking for funding under the, under the small repair grant program. Um, and the finance committee basically voted their positions on all of these articles. Um, and so they voted affirmatively on all of them with the exception of the ADU article. Um, and Adam, do you wanna to speak to the specifics in terms of what they are, uh, what they articulated in terms of their issues with it? Sure, thank you, Lee. So it was an interesting meeting. I think that they were basically vote, voting like no comment on some of the others because they didn't find that there was any yes. fiscal impact. Here, the, here, with ADUs, the absence of a quantifiable number of units for even in other municipalities uh, meant that there is inherently an impact, but it's not quantified. And so on that basis, they were voting uh, not to recommend the article. And uh, anything that we can do, you know, you know, among all of us on the board, from Artie to Paul, and then also with, with staff, for any additional conversations that we can have. I think I, you know, Alex, you spoke to a couple of municipalities. Lee, I think you did. I spoke to four um, and the planning department to try and collect some of this information. I think that's going to be helpful because I think FinCom raised some understandable questions that we're going to have to be held accountable to at town meeting. Well, it's just such a, I just want to, I, well, I just want to say, I just want to break apart yeah. the potential things that we're talking about. Is, as we know, um, you know, we, we understand there are, there are different parts of the ADU. I mean, there's the internal within the house and there's the detached part. Were they talking, were they locking everything together or were they separating it up? So it was, it was, their biggest resistance was resistance was categorized or hesitation shouldn't necessarily say resistance, but their biggest hesitation was on the rental piece. Mm -hmm. We didn't they didn't really quibble at all about whether it's detached so or detached. So they didn't they didn't they didn't break apart so, as a conversation. The, the, the elements so that they did break apart. What's their concern that they don't know if it's going to be one ADU or eight hundred ADUs and what that impact is for the because, town? Because yes, because it's gonna because there are a couple of scenarios. One they rent out, they rent out an ADU, and given that we have allow five people unrelated, in addition to maybe five or six in the primary house, uh, even though we have a limit on that. As un, the limit it's of unrelated, you no, know, the limit of unrelated is five between yeah. both structures. Between both structures, yes. right. Yeah, I you thought you meant for the ADU. No, no, no. So for both structures, you can limit a five unrelated persons. Right. But you can also Which is fill the same as for a single family house. Right, mm -hmm. correct, right. Very, uh, thank you for making that, uh, for bringing that up. The point is you could still potentially have 10 people on the lot. And that could, even though it's a one bedroom. Excuse me, did we not impose a separate limit on the number of persons in the ADU? And that limit was considerably less than five. No. Um, no I'm we trying to go by memory. It might have been two, Lee? No, we did no. not. No, we did not. No. No. We did not. No. So the, so. We're relying on the one bedroom, I guess. Yeah, so relying were, on the one I think you were relying on the one bedroom. I think the one thing they grabbed was this idea that, I mean, initially, I mean, you know, we, we brought the ADUs to the finance committee twice before, um, and twice before they've indicated that they didn't see any fiscal impact and they took no position on the article. Um, I think one of the things they grabbed this time was this idea that the ADU was going to get created and the person who was living in the single family house, which is maybe an older couple, was going to move into the ADU and then they were going to rent it off to some family with four children. And so now all of a sudden you were going to have these huge impacts on the school system. Um, 
by the by that that scenario being developed, which I don't even know if that's a really a likely scenario or even how prevalent that scenario is. So I think that's what they were kind of focusing on in terms of generating school related costs be because of that scenario being developed as opposed to the family continuing to live in their house and running it out to a single person in the unit. But I mean, you could say that, okay, so the house if, if the, if the let's say the um, two people that move into the ADU mm -hmm. and the house is rented to a family, mm -hmm. the house could go to a family anyway, mm -hmm. and they could have the ADU for the two people. I mean, yeah. 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 So, so that, 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 that all exists. That all exists. the next generation of, yeah. of It's the, the next generation. Family. It doesn't so, have to be a rental. And, and Carol, I was part of the zoning group for the housing group, and... Carol Fischetti was in my group and she said, I don't see a problem with capacity of the town. We were, oh, sorry, we were a capacity building for that, right? So there were the three groups, you were zoning, I was yeah. capacity for that. You did mention on capacity that the schools were already teetering. Well, I had, and I had Michael O'Brien also for the schools, so I can go, to, yeah. and he Please said, say. We're seeing a decline right now. Mm -hmm. And she said, I don't think I, I, I'm concerned about density of housing and other aspects, but not ADUs. So, and, and the ADUs will be minimal, the amount of impact to the town. So can I ask a favor? Can you, can you can we joke to Carol and just follow up in that conversation in the boat? I'm dying to do that. Yeah. Well, who were who the <laughs> ones who were? Oh, who, so, were, who, who were talking at the planning board at, at the finance committee meeting? Was well, that one of them, or yes, and was she also was she, she agreeing had, with her? She questioned. She questioned the impact on town services, including the schools. She, uh, as you know, and they all voted the same. Except I will note that Josh, uh, Josh opposed the motion to vote. Uh, against adoption. Uh, so I, it doesn't make sense. If, if because you the fact the of the matter is, if you yeah. don't have an ADU, you're, you're going to have an elderly couple who are going to sell, sell their house, house and move away and to a family with four children. Correct. You're going to get a family with four children in Correct. one so way or the you're, other. You're basically, no matter what, the ADU is going to be for really one or two people. That's right. So we we explained that to the finance committee, and that's still the finance committee's uh, position. What I would like us to do, we don't have to do it, what I would like us to do, and the goal is to have the zoning pass, is to collect information however we best can from these other municipalities, quantify as much as we can, provide that information as an update to the finance committee, uh, you know, together with you know, our understanding of where the impacts may be had and how significant they are. And that's a great idea, Adam, go for it. One of the things, one of the <laughs> things, one of the things that I from the conversations that I had, I think Lee and maybe Alex, you had as well, is all of the municipalities reported in that there are so few, even the community, and I, I reached out to municipalities that rent out ADUs that have been so low in impact. To see the numbers. It's, the numbers. No, that, so that's what FinCon needs. Yeah. But here's the, what I'm saying municipalities, such low numbers on these things i know that but you need to it. prove it right so what you yeah, need to say why. is two yeah. things i mean you have to have like three or four arguments one is that the trend of the municipalities that have this zoning in effect is this 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 and this and here are peers municipalities i mean you, they they're nervous about it and they're nervous about the capacity and the, and the financial cost of the town and that's their job right yeah. And um, it will be good to know what the schools, the capacity of the schools, we can ask Michael O'Brien again and say, you know, can you let us know? Because there were trends, they were doing a master plan, we were waiting for the master plan when we were talking, but none of them were concerned about it because it seemed like they were minimal. On the ADU specifically. On the ADU specifically, but there needs to be proof that the other towns, you know, that this is giving opportunities 
but That's it's right. not it's not like every house is going to become an ADU, but they don't know. So I'm just putting my FinCom hat on, I guess, you know, not a FinCom, um, to say that, that their responsibility is a fiscal responsibility to the town. And so if we have proof that that in, just in general, this is this is occurring at a certain level right. and that specifically our school system, this is the trend for it. Then I think they would feel more comfortable. I'm, so I'm speaking for them, but I'm. Well, we've accrued, I certainly, I certainly see that. Excuse me. Sure. That I mean, the existing. Let's just say we kept the we took the existing bylaw and we just said and we redefined some more people to be more different types of people to be there. Whether it's that would be the same thing as whether you're calling it a rental unit or not calling it a rental unit. In my brain, it's yeah. kind of the same thing. But now you bring up the word rental, and it kind of it sounds different. So now we we all have our bias kind of coming into the system mm -hmm. then. And so when you go to the FinCom and now you have, excuse my bias, now you have a detached ADU rental apartment that, 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 that has a little bit of visceral difference within the brain. So because within the house, you know, that, that's- It becomes another family. Yeah, yeah, very much, a lot, lot more control within there. And so, yes, it's, yeah, we brought up the word rental within the house, but it's kind of like, a, it, was, it was already happening anyway, to some extent, but I guess people weren't renting them. Well, so I think there's a visceral difference when, again, I, I know it's my bias. I know how we voted that way, but it's the detached part. It which is hidden. I understand they weren't bringing it up, yeah. but that's in, in the so, brain. That's what's it's going a for on. sure rental. Yeah, yeah so, it is a for sure rental. Although yes. it's not, I mean, that's not the case. That's well, not for sure because you could have, Nan, you could have au pairs in there. You, you and could, you could uh, have, and you could also have other yeah, yeah, but, yeah, but it's a much higher likelihood. Which, I, we're talking probability. I understand, I understand you, you want it to be low. I get that. But the probability, well, I'm sorry, you don't want it, but you're, you're stating it. The, we all state it for our, for our case. The probability is much higher that the that the that detached will be some form of rental to strangers. Now, now I know cases where that wasn't. The, I know the cases where the owner of the property moved into that external one, but then rented or, out the house. Or you have a family member. Oh, your family member. Yeah, I mean that can happen. But but in in, in viscerally in, in our brains, we we see that differently. I, I, well, I understand. We don't have to go back to that argument. Well, well I yes, but we have to understand that it's well, there. Well, we're we're. We need I, to get some make, facts. Hold on. Yeah. What I'd like to do now, to be productive, is we have a motley crew of five of us plus staff. Speak for yourself, Al. Yeah. Well, it's 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 okay. Three of us are motley. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to see <laughs> which three are locked and which two are. <laughs> What I would like to do, Marty. <laughs> Marty, would you, if, if we dip it up a list, would you make a couple of calls to a few municipalities? Sure. sure. Natasha, would you? Sure. Paul, would you make no, a couple of calls? No, I don't have time. Sorry. Okay. Gene, sure. would you? I would. Yeah. Okay, so I will. Okay. So what I'd like to do is, Lee, you and I will chat after offline, come up with a list of towns, and then uh, we'll pick up the work of the Motley. <laughs> this, is, and divvy it up. this is a big piece of work. Um, you know, I'm very much into this issue because of our work of on the um, um, uh, housing plan committee. Uh, there are many reports and articles and state agency, uh, you know, various MAPC studies, and they put the. They all say that very few. Um, you know, that's actually get a uh, permitted and built. That may be but they, what they don't have at the as an appendix is a list of towns and a number of units by year. So what but I they, found, they 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 conclude it, but they don't have the data. So I'm sorry for interrupting. Uh, so to your point, I think the Pioneer study might be, or maybe the MAPC study is 2017. So that's five years ago now, actually six years ago now. And I uh, and the and MAPC and I spoke to their senior housing uh, group, and they they don't have an inventory of ADUs by municipality, either for yeah. rent or not for that's rent, whether it's attached or detached. Yeah. So we'll come up with a list of simple questions to ask and a list of municipalities, and then uh, and then we'll report in. Uh, well, when is town meeting? It's also to ask Michael O'Brien if the, if the school 
um, finish their report yes. to see where the what the what the capacity is. Our meeting is May first. May first this year. Yeah. It's always it's always the first Monday. And, and I think we should we should stick with those yeah. that have yeah, uh, that allow rental. Yeah, yeah. not not yeah. not. Yeah. No, no, I think that's like, 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 Third. Second. We have a second and a third. Any discussion? Hearing none. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Hearing no uh, objection or dissent, and the motion carries. We are adjourned. Aye. Thank you all very much. Aye.